said, we're very happy to, to host Giovanni Escortanza for in the context you've been working on for quite some time. I've seen work, especially by, by Constanza, but also joint work of yours on this period and these uh, political economic questions. So please, the, the floor is yours for 45 minutes, as, as Simone said. All right. So uh, first of all, let me thank Simone and Hillel for the invitation. This is very kind of you. And let me apologize to uh, Joel and Fred because they have already seen this paper. I think it was a very different identification, well, very different, different identification strategy when I presented it a couple of years ago at, uh, in Luxembourg. So I hope you will not get too bored basically by this new iteration of the paper. All right. So let me start basically by uh, providing you a bit of motivation. So uh, the idea here is that when you think about group identity, group identity plays an important role in politics and has significant consequences for policy outcomes. Uh, think about the US and think about three dimensions which are uh, important here, for example. Think about gender. The extension of the franchise to women led to increases in the distribution, to changes in public health provision, and it affected even the extent of trade protection. So women basically have a policy demand, which is different from other from, from males, basically. And there is quite a bit of evidence that has I highlighted the effect, basically, of enfranchising women on the policy actually implemented by policymakers. Now, if you think about ethnic minorities, there is plenty of evidence here that following the 1965 enfranchisement of Blacks in the U.S. South, Counties with larger black populations in covert states saw an increase in state transfers, in capital spending, and even a decrease in the uh, rate of black. What about migrants? Okay, to the best of our knowledge, there is little systematic evidence on the effects of their enfranchisement, of disenfranchisement in destination countries on policies that are relevant to them. So what we know is that when it comes to policies that are relevant to migrants, immigration policy has historically been very salient. For example, Higam focusing on the progressive area has highlighted that for the immigrant, it was a matter of self-defense. Every symptom of reviving nativism aroused a fiercer, more militant immigrant opposition. Through individual appeals to the public opinion, to organization, and through political pressure, the immigrants fought back. And we know that even today, naturalized immigrants can play a very important role in national elections. So this picture is taken from the 2016 presidential campaign, where this Latino uh, American points out that there are 28.5 million Latino eligible, vote, eligible voters in 2016, and they can play a very important role in actually shaping the election outcomes. Now, what are we then doing in this paper? So we want to uh, ask the following question. What is the role of foreign-born US citizens in shaping immigration policy? And we try to answer this question focusing on a particular historical period, the progressive era, which represents an ideal environment to answer these questions. Why is it an ideal environment? First of all, there, are, there were large numbers of immigrants which were US citizens. Immigration reform was as hotly debated then as it is today. Okay, there was even a commission which had been instituted by the president, you know, the US president, the Dillingham Commission, which produced an extremely lengthy and voluminous report in 41 volumes on the state and the conditions of immigrants in the country at that time. And this represents one of the first systematic studies of the phenomenon, uh, which is carried out from a, what we call today a multidisciplinary perspective. You had economists, sociologists, political scientists, involved in uh, studying the question. The civil society were, was very strongly engaged in the issue of uh, migration, and in particular this was true for the for immigrant groups, which were quite active in terms of providing witnesses, expert witnesses uh, during the congressional action on different bills, etc., etc. The other thing which is key about our analysis is that throughout this period we can use basically significant institutional variation across US states in the access to the voting franchise. And this variation allows us to study plausible mechanisms for the effect of migrants on migration policy. Here I have a picture basically taken from a satirical magazine published basically in the late 19th century. Here you see basically Uncle Sam sitting next to a ballot box, and then you have this long queue of people coming to vote. 
these people are not standard people, okay? These are the hyphenated Americans. These are the Irish Americans. These are the German Americans. There are the French Americans. There are the Italian Americans, okay? And basically what we are trying to, to, to say basically in this paper is whether the foreign born were able actually to affect uh, policymaker choices. And our answer is yes, okay, essentially, but only when they're actually allowed to vote. Okay, so that's basically the second part of the picture. Okay, all right, so now let me then move on to uh, the structure of the presentation. I will start out providing a bunch of stylized facts on the foreign born, the extent of the suffrage, internal mobility within the United States, and then on immigration policy legislation during the progressive era. Then we're gonna turn to uh, the empirical analysis. We're gonna be discussing the threats to identification. So for those who have seen this paper already, this is the main innovation basically on uh, the project. And then we're gonna be looking at a bunch of robustness checks. All right, so let me start basically by the background on the immigrants. Okay, so this is another picture also taken from a satirical uh, newspaper of the time. This is Judge. And here you see Uncle Sam with his flag very worried about riffraff immigration, okay, and the danger it poses to American ideas and institutions, okay? And, you know, this is not a completely unmotivated uh, picture, okay? So if you look at uh, what happened throughout this period, you see basically a large inflow of foreign-born, basically which peaked around 1910 at over 1 1.3 million people per year, okay? And that led basically to an increase in the stock of immigrants between 1890 and 1920, from roughly 9.2 million in 1890 to 13.9 million in 1920. And in this period, basically, the share of foreign born basically peaked in the US at about 14.5% of the total population. Now, one important feature which we are going to be exploiting in our analysis is that many of those migrants, which we are considering, have been in the US for a while, okay? And they've actually been able to uh, naturalize if they wanted to, okay? So here I have a map for 1920, which basically gives an idea of the distribution of naturalized foreign born across different districts in the United States. And essentially what you see is that there are, the average basically in uh, this sample is about four and a half, five percent but there are districts which have about 20% of uh, their voters represented by naturalized foreign born. So they represent a quite a large constituency when it comes to the final decision making. The other thing you see is that basically there is quite a bit of variation in geography on the, concerning the scope of where basically these migrants are located, okay? The only significant exception probably is the US South. Now, when it comes to suffrage, one important piece of uh, information which I want to share with you is that following Reconstruction, so basically following the period after the Civil War, what happens is that many Southern states started to impose literacy requirements and poll taxes to systematically limit the access to the franchise for specific subgroups of the population. So typically the subgroups targeted by these measures were essentially the Blacks. Now more broadly, and this is less known as Kayser points out, there was another tool which, was, uh, which limited the franchise, which was represented by residency requirements. These residency requirements essentially required both a physical presence in the community and the intention to remain there for an indefinite period of time, okay? How does that test work? Of course, it's up a little bit up to the single official implementing the rules, but basically there was a clear idea that an individual, in order to be able to cast its ballot in national elections, had to have lived basically in a particular constituency for a while. So what were the arguments behind the residency requirements? Positive argument was that voters needed to become interested and knowledgeable about the local community if they wanted to vote and shape basically the representation the local community was enjoying in Washington. On the other hand, there was a more serious concern about the fact that citizens of any precinct should be able to protect themselves against a floating population. And here the idea basically was that there was a concern about the potential for electoral fraud. So people were very worried about potential voters moving around in the country and being able to cast multiple votes using the fact that they were living three months before in a different district. So this provision 
had actually quite important consequences when it comes to the enfranchisement or disenfranchisement of uh, Americans. Okay, this issue has been tackled by Schmidhauser, a uh, uh, law professor, in 1963 in a very nice paper. But he argued that by 1960, as a result of uh, residency requirements, about 8% of the voting age population was in practice disenfranchised, so it could not cast its ballot. So you are basically, you have to remember that you are in a context, the United States, where people move around a lot for uh, job related issues. And so not having lived basically in a constituency for more than a couple of years is not such an uncommon phenomenon. This particular provision of uh, the residency requirements, this particular provision of uh, state electoral laws, were deemed unconstitutional during the voting right era. Okay? In particular, there was a sentence by the Supreme Court in 1972, in a case brought about by an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, which turned out not to be able to vote, okay? which basically sentenced that these kind of requirements were uh, unconstitutional and they had to be reduced to something no more than 30 days. Okay, so complete uh, reversal basically of uh, the restriction. All right, now just to give you an idea of uh, the importance of those requirements, here I have a map basically for the residency requirement as of 1890. Okay, and here the variation basically is in years. Okay, so you can see basically there are some states where essentially you can vote right after you move there. Okay. But there are other states which require up to two years of uh, residency in the state in order to be able to cast a ballot in a national election. And this is the kind of variation which will allow us to identify whether people which are moving around, like migrants were, were actually enabled to cast their ballots. All right, so what about the internal mobility? Okay, so there is a famous quote by Tocqueville, okay, which we always want to, to mention, that Amer the Americans are a mobile people. They okay, are people which are moving around a lot. Okay? The other thing which has been documented is that migrants actually tend to be, by definition, selected into a, an even greater level of mobility. Okay? And what we have tried to do with Costanza and a lot of work has been to document basically internal mobility or to provide you some idea of internal mobility in this period using a bunch of different sources. So here basically what we have are interstate mobility rates, okay, measured in uh, using data basically from the three censuses we are taking advantage of, the 1900, 1910, and 1920 census. So the first set of results in panel A basically focus on a population aged between 27 and 67, okay? And these uh, calculations are carried out basically from the census, looking basically at uh, a survival method, whereby basically what we are doing is to project the expected number of uh, uh, natives or migrants we should observe 10 years down the road, okay, compared to today, okay? And adjust this projection by taking into account mortality, which is uh, measured basically using uh, statistical sources of the time, and also by looking basically at information we have on the outflow of migrants, of the permanent outflow, outflow of outflow of migrants, which is recorded in the statistics. Moreover, we have also information in this period on the number of naturalized citizens, okay, which took the oath of becoming U.S. citizens basically in every year in every state, okay. So using all this information, basically, we are able to document that migrants are significantly more mobile than natives, okay? So they are more likely to change their state of residence than native, both between 1900 and 1910, and also between 1910 and 1920. So in panel B and panel C, we use a different data set. This data set basically has been kindly provided by Dani Abramitsky, and these are basically linked census data, okay? They focus on a different population, a population aged 18 to 35 in 1900, okay? And basically we have two way of using this information. These are longitudinal data, so we have, we are able basically to track individuals over three different censuses, okay? And in the first panel, we just use the average probability of observing an individual in state A in 1900 and state B, say, in uh, 1910, okay? and compare that to for natives and migrants. And in the second panel instead, basically, we are running a probit model in which we also account for age, years since migration, and 
country of birth for the migrants or state of birth for the migrants. Okay, so as you can see, the numbers are quite different. Okay, they are not really identical across the two panels. This is in part due to the fact that this is a much older population than the one we uh, have in the two bottom panels. So this, these individuals here are much more likely to move around than the one we see up, upstairs. But the message which we want to convey is still the same. We see natives being much less likely to move around within the country than migrants. Okay, so then if we think about the uh, residency requirement as a restriction to the right to vote, this restriction to the right to vote is much more likely to be binding, okay, for the migrants than for the natives in our data. Okay. All right, so just to give you an idea of what happened in 1920, so here I have a picture basically for interstate mobility as of 1920, and you can see basically immediately, okay, that there is quite a significant amount of variation in interstate mobility, okay, and that of course for the migrants, the numbers are on average much higher than for the natives. Okay, that's again basically the information we want to use in our analysis. All right, so what about immigration policy? Okay, so if you look at US immigration policy in this period, towards the Europeans, the US were quite open. So most of uh, European migration in, during the 19th century was essentially unencumbered. By the mid 1890s, a debate started to linger in the US Congress uh, concerning basically the need to control migration. Okay, so for example, in the 1896 Republican platform for the presidential election, there was a clear point made about the need to restrict immigration. So for the protection of the quality of our American citizenship and for the wages of our working men against the fatal competition of low priced labor, we demand that immigration laws be thoroughly enforced and so extended as to exclude from entrance to the United States those who can neither read nor write. Okay? So these were essentially the Republicans were asking for literacy test provisions, okay? And this was basically a set of measures which was hotly debated starting in 1896 and basically up until the middle of World War I. And of course, this little paragraph is not taken from Trump 2015. So it's not uh, a sentence which appeared in his campaign, but was very similar, okay? All right, so at the end of the story, basically, if you look at the migration policy throughout this period, the first time the uh, literacy test provision was put in front of the US Congress was in 1896, 1897. It was finally introduced only in 1917 after three presidential vetoes were put forward. Okay. By itself, by the time basically the literacy test provision was enacted, it was no longer very effective. Okay, it was meant to be an instrument to limit basically the inflow of unskilled workers to the US. Okay, by the time basically it finally became a law, most of the migrants coming in were actually able to uh, read and write. Okay, so in that sense, it didn't really work. Okay, what happened though is that ushered in essentially the so called national quota system, which was finally introduced in 1924, and as we know, basically changed dramatically the US immigration policy making it much, much more restrictive than it used to be, okay? All right, so the bills we are considering essentially as our left-hand side variable, the vote of the bills we are considering as our left-hand side variable are 14. They take place between 1897 and 1994. So if you look at the bills, essentially are all towards basically restricting migration, okay? And if you again look at the way uh, representatives have voted on those bills, First thing that comes to immediately to your attention is that there is quite a large number of abstention. Okay, so people or a lot of representatives, especially in the early period and in the late period, did not really want to commit to one view or another because they were essentially worried about making a mistake with their electorate. Okay. The other thing you see basically is that whenever a vote was cast, okay, you see that typically the majority of uh, the, the, the house basically was in favor of a restrictive measure. Many of those bills or of those measures didn't make it as a law, either because they got stopped in the Senate or because of presidential vetoes, which as I mentioned, were uh, introduced three times to try to block the literacy test program. All right, so now what about the main explanatory variables? So what we have done in this version of uh, the paper, another uh, novelty, is that we have used basically the 
full census data. So here, basically, what we have done is to take advantage of the newly made available individual level full census data. So we constructed, basically, information aggregating that data set, OK? So the information we uh, are able to obtain is reliable at the county level, OK? But the census does not contain direct information on the congressional districts, OK? So what are the problems with this type of data then for our purposes? First thing is that counties might be split into different districts. Second is that districts might span multiple counties, OK? There is periodic redistricting taking place after every single census, OK? And so to deal with this type of problems, what we have done in the new version of the paper is to focus on county by district cells, OK? Following here the methodology developed by Dorn and his co-authors in a recent paper. And then what we have done basically is to introduce county fixed effects in all our specifications to account for unobserved heterogeneity in economic and political conditions that could explain basically some of the outcomes we are interested in. Just to give you an idea, so here I have Massachusetts and the configuration of congressional districts and counties during the 62nd uh, Congress. So here, essentially, what you see, for example, is that if you focus on district number one, OK, there are four counties, OK, Berkshire, Franklin, Hampshire, and Hampton, which make up basically district number one, OK? But we also see that Ham while Berkshire is entirely uh, encompassed by district number one, you see that some counties like Hampton also have part of their territory in district number two. OK, so essentially, what we are going to do, going to do in our analysis, is to treat basically the cell county times district as a separate cell. Okay, and we will do the analysis using that variation. So, in particular, if you look at our model, then on the left hand side, what we will have is the vote of uh, an individual representative I, which represents a county district cell CD. On a, on a bill, basically, which was aiming at restricting migration and which was voted in Congress at time t. Okay, so that's our dependent value. Okay, and remember here, basically, the way the data are coded is that a vote equal to one means that the representative is in favor of a bill that restricts migration. Okay, what is the main interest of our analysis? We want to focus on the role played by this by the migrant communities, enfranchised in particular migrant communities, in shaping basically the policies implemented by, um, by, the, by the local politician, the politician which is elected in that particular area. So our two main variables of interest are a dummy variable H4, which basically tells us where this particular county district cell is characterized by a large foreign-born population that is naturalized, OK? And then we use also information on the effectiveness of the residency requirements. And note that these residency requirements only vary at the state level. Okay? And in our baseline specification, we are using basically variation, which is um, only cross-sectional. Okay? So it's based basically on what we observe in 1890. Okay? In the baseline model, what we are going to do is to pick basically a, a dummy or a threshold for the dummy variable, which basically is at the top quartile, basically, of the distribution in the country. And what we do in robustness check is to see, basically, what happens if we play around with different possible thresholds. Essentially, the message that comes about is that the effect of foreign-born is nonlinear, OK? And in order for foreign-born to play a role in shaping the voting behavior of elected representatives, the constituency, the number, the, the share needs to be sufficiently large, OK? So essentially, we don't see anything at the median. We start seeing an effect basically starting from the 70th percentile onwards. OK? All our specification will include controls basically at the county times district level and at the individual representative level. And all our specification, more importantly, include county fixed effects. So we are using basically variation within counties over time. OK? Bear in mind that in this time period, we have about 3,200 counties in the United States. So specification is quite demanding. Okay? And then we also have Congress fixed effects, which are basically captured by IT. Okay? 
All our regressions are weighted by the population share of the cell in the district, okay? So to make sure that every voter basically receives the same weight, okay? And the standard errors are clustered at the district time Congress level. Okay, we have played around with alternative specifications. Costanza will be happy to answer all the questions you might have on clustering, okay? All right, so let me show you the baseline results. Okay, so these are the fixed effects model. The Ivani, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, Steve, go ahead. We're not, do you, where do kind of non-naturalized immigrants fit into this? You just leave them out entirely? I mean, I, I guess I would have some worry about maybe the endogeneity. Like I'm, an, I'm not a naturalized immigrant and I see these voting policies getting more difficult that maybe that would encourage me to naturalize. I don't know if it, Definitely. Kind of how it matters. Yeah, that's a very good point. So this is one of the sources of our concerns with identification. So two, two sources of concern. One basically is that migrants could choose where to live, basically in which particular districts they want to live. The second is what we call endogenous mobilization. So you might, Steve, you might decide to take on Italian citizenship, God, God forbid, okay, in order to affect basically how your politicians will vote on migration policy issues, for example, okay? And so we deal with that basically with uh, our instrumental variable approach. And I will get there in a second. Okay. <laughs> the other thing, wait, 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 Steve, I'm not done yet. So the other thing we do basically, we have also a placebo exercise in which basically instead of focusing on, instead of defining basically our proxy for high number of uh, naturalized migrants uh, using basically only those migrants which are citizens, we replace that variable with just uh, known and naturalized migrants. Okay, so we run the same regression, but then we are basically replacing the high share of foreign born with basically just the non naturalized. And what we see basically is no effect, basically, in terms of explaining the voting behavior of the representative. Okay, so that's the other way we tackle uh, your question. Okay, so the results. So the first specification is a very parsimonious one in which we only control for our indicator for high, uh, high share of foreign born, okay? And essentially what we see here basically is that in the presence of high share of foreign born, the representatives are more likely to vote in favor of a restrictionist migration policy, okay? Now, this result confirms, if you want, previous findings, for example, by Tabellini, Marco Tabellini in his recent study paper, okay? What we do though is uh, to try to basically see whether this overall effect we uncover is due simply to the fact that politicians might just dislike migrants, okay? Or it might be driven by the fact that there are compositional effects, okay? Or heterogeneous effects. So in the second specification, we start decomposing basically the effect of a high share of foreign born by interacting it with the residency requirements at the local level. In column three, we also add district level characteristics like the share of urban in the population, GDP at the uh, district level, uh, the share of individuals in agricultural sector, et cetera, et cetera. And in column four, we also add individual representative characteristics. In other words, whether he is affiliated with the Democratic Party, whether he is a Southern Democrat, his age, whether he went to the yeah, Ivy League school, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens basically? Let's focus directly on specification number four. So what happens basically here is that once we account for the fact that uh, residency requirements vary across uh, states and therefore enable differently migrants to vote or not, what we find here basically is that whenever uh, residency requirements are um, set to zero, having a large share of naturalized foreign born in a district basically is correlated with a representative being less likely to vote in favor of uh, uh, a restriction, okay? And only basically the effect of disenfranchisement mm, brought about by the residency requirement actually offsets mm, the effect basically of uh, uh, this chunk. Okay, so this aggregate effect can then be decomposed in a direct effect of a high share of foreign born, which is actually negative, and then an indirect effect via basically the residency requirement, which explains the average effect in column one. So what else do we learn from this specification? We see that basically uh, county districts basically which are richer tend to, representative of those county districts tend to be more in favor of uh, keeping the door open, okay? County districts which are characterized by a larger share of uh, employment in agricultural sector tend to be more restrictionist, okay? And more important for our analysis, we see that basically whenever the politician in power is a Democrat, he's 
more likely to support an open door policy. And this is again a fact which has been found many times before in the literature, for example, by Arison Schefter in their very nice paper. And here we also find, on the other hand, that there is a difference in the behavior of uh, Democrats elected in the North from Democrats elected in the US South, which seem to be much more against basically the migration. Okay? All right, what can be the channels explaining this result? Our preferred story is that the channel that could be behind this finding is the electoral accountability of representatives. So how do we explore this channel? We proceed in three ways. The first, basically, is to focus on the role of the immigrant bloc in safe versus non-safe districts. The second is to look at the behavior of politicians that are ideologically committed to an open-door policy. Okay, And finally, the third is to look at the role of representatives' immigration status. So let's start basically with the first possible channel. So here, basically, the idea is that we focus on districts which were won by a, mar a narrow margin in the previous election. This makes those districts more risky from the point of view of uh, a representative because he knows that small changes, basically, in the supporting coalition could lead him to lose his seat. All right, so then what we do in column one, basically, we interact our main uh, explanatory variables with a dummy variable which take a value of one if basically the district is marginal, okay? So then the baseline coefficients, okay, of our two main variables capture basically the effect of having a high share of foreign born and its interaction with residency for districts which were born with a large match, okay? So essentially what you see here is that our pattern we had uncovered in a previous regression is not driven by those districts, okay? It is actually driven by the districts which were won by a small margin, okay, by the representative. So in other words, what we are saying here is that the migrants were able to exercise power over the uh, politician in charge only in those districts in which basically the politician won by a small margin and therefore where basically they might need the vote of the migrants in terms of uh, uh, being re-elected to power. In the second column, what we do basically is to analyze instead the role basically of affiliation with the Democratic Party. As we have seen already, Democrats were more likely to favor basically keeping an open door towards migration, okay? And as a result, our hypothesis basically is that Democratic politicians were gonna be less likely to be sensitive, okay, to having basically a large group of uh, migrants in their constituency, in terms of the way they vote, okay? And to assess this, uh, this idea, basically, once again, we deploy a triple interaction term, okay? But we allow, basically, the effect of uh, uh, high foreign born and high foreign born times residency to vary depending, basically, on the party affiliation of the representative. So once again, the baseline then represents the effect of having a large population of naturalized migrants and its interaction with residency for politicians that belong to the uh, Republican Party, essentially, okay? And the interaction basically affects instead what happens if you are a Democrat, okay? And as expected, basically, we see a lower sensitivity of the decisions basically by a Democratic policymaker in the presence of a high foreign born population compared basically to the Republicans. In the last uh, specification, what we do instead is to control for whether basically the representative was born abroad or born in the US. So essentially, we don't, there are very few of them, first of all, okay, but and we don't find any effect, any direct effect. We just find a small, non significant coefficient, which is in line with our expectations. But more importantly, uh, controlling basically for the country of birth of the representative does not affect our baseline results. All right, so now let's go to the uh, concerns with identification. So as I mentioned already to Steve, there are two main concerns when it comes to identification. They all have to do basically with the endogeneity of the share of naturalized migrants. The first is that migrants might sort into districts where political conditions are more favorable. So in other words, where representatives are more open towards migration. Okay, you go there because, you know, people are nicer to you, okay? The other concern is that local party organization might actually seek to incorporate migrants in their constituency, okay? And 
this is a mean to form what we what um, shares are called in this literature a minimum winning coalition okay and this is more likely to occur in districts where the representatives are typically against migration so in general basically the bias brought about by the endogeneity of the share of naturalized migrants is ambiguous so how do we handle this bias? so we do it in various ways first thing you want to bear in mind is that even today several political scientists including Jim Snyder and David Stromberg and Deli Carpini and his co-authors have argued that Americans do not know much about the elected politicians okay they don't know who they are they don't know what kind of views they have on many different issues okay aside that what we're doing in analysis is to first of all we deploy county fixed effects okay in all our specification and this uh, should reduce the concern with endogeneity as long as the areas which we are studying are characterized by permanent differences in the orientation towards migrants. Second thing we do is to test whether current representatives voting behavior on restrictive immigration policies affects the future attractiveness of a particular county district cell to migrants. Okay, and finally we deploy a standard ID strategy. So let me show you, uh, first of all, the, the regression results when we basically study the effect of uh, current voting behavior of uh, representatives on future changes in our explanatory values. Okay, so here we have four specifications, okay, and we basically start with a very parsimonious one and then we start adding all the controls we have in our base. Essentially, what you find here is that current voting behavior does not predict changes basically in the concentration of migrants in the future. Okay, so this type of result should alleviate the concern you have with the potential endogeneity of the location choice of uh, migrants as a result, basically, of uh, different political preferences of our constituents. Then we are not still uh, not happy, or better, the referees, I'm, we are sure, will, will still not be happy. Hence, we build a standard shift share instrument, okay, where basically what we are doing here, we are taking basically the share of naturalized foreign born in the county district as of 1890. Okay, so that's the first year we can observe in our data. Okay, and then we uh, attribute basically subsequent flows at the national level as usual, basically on those districts based basically on the initial distribution of the migrants by country of origin. Okay, that's basically fairly standard. So what are uh, our results? So first of all, let me show you a partial correlation, give you an idea that this instrument works well. I checked with Costanza that if we take out this uh, uh, outlier over here, our results are actually even better. So this correlation is actually even stronger. Now, if we throw the instrument in our model, basically as we do in specification one, you can see basically that our baseline coefficients are of the same sign and significance. What happens is that the magnitudes are in absolute value bigger than before. And this basically suggests that if anything, we are probably dealing with a bias which has to do with endogenous mobilization of migrants by local political parties. Okay. All right. Now we know that card style instruments are now have been uh, have received a lot of attention uh, in the literature there are various issues which have been raised so we try to tackle that in uh, the remainder of this table so in the second specification we worry about the concern uh, highlighted by Jaeger and his co-author that the instruments uh, conflate short and long-run responses to migration in particular one could worry about the fact that immigration flows could decrease support for immigration restriction in the short run okay but on the other hand, they could trigger a long-term response in the opposite direction, for example, by eliciting nativism. The solution proposed by the literature is to add lagged immigration stock and use lagged back party instruments. So in the second specification, we do that. Okay, as you can see, basically the coefficients of interest show very little change. Okay. Borusiak et al. and Goldsmith and Pickham et al highlight another possible concern, namely that the share of naturalized in 1890 might predict congressmen voting via other channels, and in particular unobserved characteristics that make an area attractive in the late 1800s and correlate with subsequent migration patterns. So what is our proposed solution is to control basically for the interaction between the decade and initial economic characteristics, and in particular here 
the share of employment in agriculture, and initial political characteristics, namely the share of democratic votes in the initial election. By doing so, we capture potential different trajectories between county district cells. That's what we do basically in specification three and four. And essentially what you can see is that adding these additional controls does not really affect very much the uh, result of our baseline ID. Okay? All right, so now if uh, uh, the other two things we do, I'm going to uh, be very quick here, we uh, assess uh, more generally the performance of our ID strategy using Conway bounds, okay? So here the idea basically is to relax the strict exogeneity assumption of uh, our uh, instrumental variables, okay? And essentially what we show here basically is uh, what happens if we assume basically the coefficient on the IV variable basically to be normally distributed with a mean not necessarily equal to zero. Okay, so we have various possible values down here. Okay, and so the results basically are robust, okay, when we basically allow for the exclusion restriction not to be perfectly satisfied. All right, what else do we do in the analysis? So we play around with uh, a bunch of alternative tests. Basically, one result I wanted to show you because it came out before in the question is this placebo test, okay? So here, basically, what we do, we take our baseline specification, okay, a fixed effect baseline specification, and we play around with two alternative definition of our main explanatory variable, okay? So instead of using, basically, the high share of naturalized foreign-born, we replace that variable with a high share of young. The young in this time period, these are individuals less than 21 years old, the young are not allowed to vote, okay? So we expect having a high share of young not to matter. And in fact, is that what we, we find, okay? And over here, we replace that variable, uh, the, our key explanatory variable, namely the share of naturalized foreign born with a definition based on known foreign born that are known citizens. And here, basically, what is important to Steve's point, we don't find any effect. So this group basically does not contribute to affect in any way the voting behavior of the elected representative at the local level, okay? And then we have a bunch of other uh, robustness checks we perform, especially, focusing especially on alternative definition of the key explanatory variables. In particular, we show that, uh, as I mentioned already before, only if you have a large enough group of uh, foreign born in uh, your um, constituency, basically, this will affect the behavior of the representatives. Okay, I think I'm out of time. So just to conclude, basically, what we have seen basically is that foreign born Americans were able to play a, an important role in shaping migration policy in the United States, okay? They had different preferences compared to other constituencies, in particular compared to natives, okay? And basically this in a way brings an important trade-off for uh, today's policymakers because by enfranchising migrants, they might be able to favor their incorporation in the destination country community, but on the other hand, they might end up having policies or supporting policies which are not the same preferred by the natives. Okay, so that's it. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Giovanni. So I have a few questions and remarks, uh, so I will uh, make them quickly and then I will let Simone uh, manage the, the flow of, uh, of questions from others. Of course, it is uh, super interesting. My uh, request would be maybe, I'm sure this is in the paper, but maybe we need a bit more background on, you know, what kind of elections are these? Is it majority voting? Is it proportional voting? I wasn't sure whether the county representatives are to the federal or to the local Senate. So can you very factually tell me if sure. this is so, local? All right, so basically these are congressional elections. So these are 435 congressmen which are elected basically in congressional districts. Okay? So these are electoral counties. So basically the way you think about it is that you have a county which is an administrative unit, there are 3,200 of them in the US, Okay, and you superimpose to the county, okay, you superimpose congress. The electoral district. That's right, yeah. And so basically the unit of observation is a, portion, a county times a district, okay? So then we have a portion of a county which belongs to a district, a portion of a county which belongs to another. And each district has only one, is sending one representative. Correct, yep. 
Okay. And this is majority, uh, so yeah. then it's simple. Yeah. I mean, right. it's... Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, the, the, the one question I, I may want to ask you, you said you, you control for internal migration. It's known that it's also a period of large black migration from the south to the north, the west, and so on. And I uh, was wondering whether there are any interesting interactions to explore here, because, I mean, coming from the European context, we, we know there is, uh, you know, there could be, you know, interaction between different types of migration. And, and also, I, I was also to explain the restrictions in terms of residency and franchise in, in, in general uh, could be targeting not just uh, the immigrants, but also the, the, the black population in terms of uh, enfranchisement. So that's a more contextual question than uh, on the methods. So these are very good questions. I didn't have time to go to this table. So one thing we did in this table is to allow basically um, to control directly for natives internal migration. Okay, So we are basically looking at whether being in a county district with a lot of internal migration by natives has an effect basically on the voting behavior on migration policy. And here, basically, you see that that did not seem to play a role. And yes, so I was there, wondering sorry. whether if you decompose the internal migration by ethnicity, whether you, you have any interesting... Uh, that's, uh, that's, so we haven't done that say. directly. So what we have done, basically, is to do the same exercise for uh, counties which have a lot of blacks, basically. And again, we don't find a differential effect. What we have done is to take inspiration from your work with Alberto, and we look, basically, at the diversity of uh, the migrant population. Basically. Okay, so here, basically, what we are doing is to try to see whether the migrants are perceived as being more or less of a threat for the natives, depending on whether they all come from the same uh, county of origin background or they are more dispersed. Okay, so that's what we have not done, and maybe we could do that uh, for a uh, future iteration to see basically what happens if we they allow, we, we basically have an, an interaction between inter black and migrants, basically. So we are looking at the regions where we have a lot of blacks, which are internal migrants. Okay, that's a good point. We haven't done that. That's a suggestion. Okay, thank you. So I know from Simone that uh, Madeline Zavodny wants to, to ask a question. Thank you. Um, I like the paper a lot. It was very interesting. Uh, so I have three questions, actually, if that's all right. Yep. Um, First one, uh, are there, as I understand it, all of these votes were restrictionist laws, right? So are there any positive pro-immigrant laws you could look at as well? Um, that's one, it may just be no. Second, as I understand it, you're treating all immigrants regardless of country of origin the same. So it would be interesting, of course, to look at those from countries of origin that were going to be impacted, like the Italians versus the Germans and the Irish, who those, those flows had largely dried up. And then to the extent possible, the second generation as well, because perhaps you know they want to be able to bring over grandma or something or yeah. their cousins or whatever. And then third, I'm not sure if you showed it and I blinked and missed it, or if not, I'm giving you an opening to show um, what happens if the representative is foreign born. Yeah. All right, so, um, all right, so three questions, basically. So the first one, okay, so the first one concerns the deals we have selected. So the way we did, basically, was to take the book by Hutchinson, which is the Bible, basically, on uh, immigrate congression, the congressional politics of immigration. And as far as we know, there were no bills in favor, basically, of uh, opening up migration, which reached the floor uh, of uh, the House. So basically, here, what we are focusing on are bills which were actually voted upon during this time period to try to, um, to, to vote voted upon. So basically it's a final passage vote, essentially, which both uh, bills which were up or down for being enacted. So that's one question. So the second point, you are very much right. So we could exploit, but now that we have actually the census data, the 100% census sample, we could exploit basically heterogeneous effects depending on the type of uh, the country of origin of the migrants. Of course, the issue basically here, my concern is that basically we need, as a, our analysis basically shows that you need to have a large enough constituency of migrants in order basically for that to matter in terms of affecting the uh, voting behavior of the representatives. And now we need to see whether there are basically some areas in which you would have like a large enough constituency of a single group basically, or a single group of uh, 
nation of origin of migrants, basically, which could actually help us disentangle the effect. But that is something which we could potentially explore and see what happens. The last question you have, basically, so uh, no, the other you had another question, basically, concerning the effect of second generations, right? And there, what I have, again, we didn't have time to go through that, but I have basically here an alternative specification where we replace our definition of high share of foreign born, okay, with basically a defini- the second generation, okay? So we are replacing that with a high concentration of second generation migrants. And what you find here basically is that these guys having a high share of foreign born, uh, second generation foreign born, does not affect basically the voting behavior of uh, the representative. So the way we read this uh, particular result is to say that basically uh, the second generation migrants have essentially assimilated mm, into the mainstream views of the Americans. Okay. We had also another set of results where we compared basically the results basically for the naturalized, which we had before, with results basically for naturalized, which have been in the country for at least 10 years. Okay. So the idea again is to try to tackle this uh, intuition that the longer basically the migrant is in the country, the more he becomes assimilated in terms of his views towards uh, uh, migration, because maybe the, he has already brought in the family, he has already brought in the ma- grandmother, etc. Et and what we find basically when we look at the long stayers, essentially are similar, very similar results compared to the uh, just naturalized. Clearly, on the other hand, when you look at the second generation, they seem to have preferences which are very much aligned with those of the natives. The last question you had was concerning the country of birth of the representative. And for that, we have results. And I think I probably went too fast. Find basically a a negative effect for, um, let me show you, is over here. So we find a negative but not significant effect for the dummy born abroad. Essentially, this is telling us that, uh, remember the the left-hand side variable here is vote in favor of restrictions, okay? So, Representatives which are born abroad seem to have a lower propensity to vote in favor of a restriction, but this basically is not significant. Okay, again, the number of representatives in our sample which are born abroad is very small. Don't have the number in my exactly in my mind, but basically the numbers are very, very small. Okay, thank you. So now next in line we have Simone. Yeah, thanks, Giovanni. Very nice presentation. I just have two questions. The first one is whether you have looked a bit more into the issue of the high share of abstention. So what do you get if you put them together with a favorable or with a, with a yes or with a no votes? And the second thing is whether you have any evidence with respect to the, to the, to the enforcement of the residency requirements across states. Was this uniform or there were big variations? Because I was thinking that maybe this is, because it, it doesn't seem obvious to me to enforce this requirement more than one century ago. So I would just like to know whether you have any evidence of the extent of disenfranchisement across across different states. Okay. So the first question, yes, I have done that. Okay, let me show you. I had prepared them in my comprehensive extensions. <laughs> okay. So alternative definition of dependent variables. So essentially what we do, we play around with the definition and we also basically carry out a Heckman selection model. Okay, so basically the idea is to try to account for the fact that first you decide whether to cast or not the ballot, and then if you cast a ballot, whether you support or not the restriction. So basically, as you can see from the regression result, the patterns are still there. Okay, so they are not really dramatically affected. Um, the second point, in terms of the enforcement, this is a very good point. So we spend quite a bit of time trying to gather anecdotal evidence okay, on the, how basically this enforcement was carried out. And I think if I remember correctly, Costanza, please help here. We have a long footnote in the paper where basically we describe the experiences of uh, a couple of uh, um, uh, local city employees, basically, which had to assess basically whether an individual actually fulfilled the residency requirements. Okay. And then basically the enforcement varied dramatically across states because essentially these are state provisions and essentially I mean, they put them in place, but then, you know, there are states which work better than others. If you think about rural states in the middle of, uh, of the U.S., probably the enforcement in Montana was not nearly as strict as it could have been uh, in New York, where basically migrants could be a very important constituency to play around with. Okay. okay. So, and, and then the, 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 the follow-up is whether 
So clearly you don't have a measure of, of uh, enforcement and I fully understand, but whether there's any concern about a correlation between the length of the residency requirement and state capacity. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's feasible to get any data on this, but in a sense, whether states that they had a larger yeah larger capacity tended to have shorter or longer requirements so what i can tell you from uh, i was looking just before the presentation i was looking at the residency requirements okay so you basically see that the three states which have uh, three out of the four states which have the longest residency requirements are essentially mississippi uh, north carolina and south carolina but then you also have rhode island okay rhode island you think is like you know is a fairly you know, New England, fairly advanced, fairly well regulated state. So not obvious pattern there. Also, when you look at the, the states which have less basically residency requirement close to zero, again, you don't, I mean, I, I, you see some of them basically are in the Midwest, in the South, Southeast, Southwest, sorry. But then you also have some of them like, in, like Indiana or Michigan. So I mean, there are no, I mean, to me at least there were no obvious patterns, but if we could come up with a measure of uh, state capacity at the local level, we could basically try to think about using that information to basically assess the, the st how strictly enforced the requirements were. That could be an instrument, for example. Yeah, I need to think about how to use it, but that's a good question. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So I think we reached the time limit. Uh, of course, anyone who has more questions or thoughts is welcome to, to send them directly to Giovanni and to Costanza. So thank you very much to, to the two of you. It's a, an exciting uh, topic, uh, mixing political economy in a historical context. And uh, many of us really enjoy this type of, uh, of study. So thank you for uh, uh, sharing it with us. So goodbye, everybody. Bye. And see you next time. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.